So we're going to do some quick review here first. We're going to start with area between curves. We talked about this last week. The area between curves, we're going to say that area is equal to, please copy this down so you have this again in your notebook. Area is equal to the integral of the top minus the bottom. This is true whether or not your graph is above the x-axis or below the x-axis, or they're both above or both below, or one's above or one's below. Always we're going to do the top curve, literally whichever one is on top, minus the bottom curve, and we're going to take an integral of that. Okay, now that's true most of the time. That's what we've talked about so far. That's true when we're taking it with respect to x. Anytime where we're taking it with respect to x, which means we have a dx on that equation, we're going to do the top curve minus the bottom curve. And our bounds are going to be from x equals a to x equals b. Sometimes those bounds are provided for you. Like they'll say, find the area between the curve from one to four, from x equals one to x equals four. That would mean they're provided for you. Sometimes you're going to have to set your two equations equal to each other to find intersection points, right? And we did that in class last week. So sometimes you're going to have to find what those intersection points are in order to find your bounds. But there is another way that we can find area, and that is when we are finding the area with respect to y. If we were finding the area with respect to y, we would say area equals, or we're not going to write a equals, by the way. I'm writing the word area. I want you to write the word area. Okay. So if we were taking it with respect to y, instead of doing top minus bottom, what we would do, and this is important, we would do right minus left. So instead of top minus bottom, you would take whatever curve is to the right, the farthest to the right minus the uh, furthest to the left. You would do right minus left. That's for a dy curve. And again, this time you would have your bounds and everything in your equation, including the functions themselves, everything would be in terms of y. So you wouldn't go from x equals something to x equals something. You would go from y equals something to y equals something. Okay, that's how we find area between curves. Most of you did a lot of those problems and are fine. Hopefully you've started your FRQs that are due tonight. The first question I think on all three of those is about area between curves and you should know how to solve those, okay? Volumes of revolution is the brand new stuff. Okay, so volumes of revolution, we talked about this. Again, I'm gonna encourage you to go back and watch that video. It's posted on my YouTube channel. It's also posted on Google Classroom so you can watch it. Volume of revolution, you're gonna say volume is equal to, we're gonna set up, the what I call the bones of the equation, which means we're going to have pi times an integral of something squared minus something squared. It is really important that you get in the habit anytime you see that it's asking you to find a volume where something is being revolved or rotated. Those two words, if you see those, if it's asking you to find the volume of something being revolved or find the volume of something being rotated, this is what you should set up first every single time. Okay, always this. Now we have some things that are options. We have two different ways we're gonna write this. Again, sometimes this is with respect to X. So sometimes I'm gonna have a DX out here. It's not always gonna be with respect to X. Sometimes it's gonna be with respect to X. And what I said in the video is that it's with respect to X. Some of you are not focused and it's really worrying me. You're like having other conversations or looking around, please make sure you're focused. I can't express enough how important this is, okay? So you're gonna take this integral with respect to X if you are rotating it this way. Anytime you are taking a function and you are rotating it, so rotate about a horizontal line, anytime you are rotating it about a horizontal line, so that could be the x-axis, that could be y equals one, that could be y equals negative two, anytime you're rotating it this way about a horizontal line, that is going to be a dx equation, meaning you're also going to have x equals a and x equals b as your bounds, so bounds in terms of x, your functions are going to be in terms of x. Does anyone remember what goes inside of here? what goes inside those parentheses? The okay. outer radius. The outer. outer radius, excellent job. And then what's the other one, Jack? The inner radius. The inner radius. And so uh, we'll do an example of that here today. Uh, and again, you can see that on the video, what that means. I just like to abbreviate those R out and R in, but we're looking at the outer radius and the inner radius. Again, that is for when we are doing it with respect to X. It is very similar if you do it with respect to Y. So volume equals pi integral something squared minus something squared 
This time we would have a dy here. You have a dy anytime you rotate about a vertical line. So for example, if I'm rotating it about the y-axis or about x equals negative one or about x equals positive one or something like that, those are vertical lines. Anytime you're rotating it this way, you are going to have a dy equation. You should have a y equals on your bounds. So our bounds are going to go from y to a y instead of x to an x. And everything inside of that parentheses in there is going to have to be with respect to y. I did some examples on the other video where you can see how this works. So again, I encourage you to do that. And again, the stuff inside of there is still our r out, our outer radius and our r in, which represents our inner radius. Okay, the black stuff is like the bones of the equation though. So you have to start with the black stuff before you do anything else. Okay, we're gonna add something to this topic today, which is called cross-sectional volume. And there's a method that's very helpful to follow here when you're trying to solve for a cross-sectional volume. Okay, so this is not gonna be the equation off the bat because the equation is not as consistent as in the other two. For area, it's always top minus bottom or right minus left. For volume of revolutions, it's always pi, don't forget the pi, the integral of something squared minus something squared and then either dx or dy. But for cross-sectional volume, it can vary quite a bit. The process to solve for our cross-sectional volume is first to write an expression for the base. We're gonna start by writing an expression for the base. I, this is not going to make sense until we do an example. So just make sure you copy these down so you understand the process. So for cross-sectional example, for cross-sectional volume, we're going to start by writing an expression for the base. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to write an equation for area. You're going to be given a shape and you're going to have to write the equation for area using the base. So first you're going to write an equation for the base, then you're going to write an equation for area using the base. And then finally, you're going to integrate the area equation. Okay, and again, we'll do an example. So this will start to make some sense. These are a little challenging to visualize. Kind of all of these things are challenging to visualize. So it is really important you understand the steps to follow here, okay? Today, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do some FRQ examples because you have FRQ homework. I wanna make sure you feel comfortable with how to show your work, what the expectations are, how the approaches work. Okay, and we'll, it'll give us a chance to review some other things while we're at it. Okay, so here's the first one. You don't need to copy all this down. Again, I'm recording this, so I'll throw this up later. Uh, this is an actual FRQ question. I don't remember what year it's from, uh, but this is a pretty standard question. So it shows you a picture. You're not always given a picture, unfortunately, but this one does. It says, let f of x equals 2x squared minus 6x plus 4, and g of x equals 4 cosine of 1 fourth pi x. I would write down f of x and what it equals in your notes, and I would write down g of x and what it equals in your notes. If you've not done that already, you don't need to write all the words, write f of x equals and the g of x equals in your notes. While you're doing that, I'm going to keep reading. So it says, let r be the region bounded by the graphs of f and g as shown in the figure above, minus shown to the figure off to the side. Okay, so it gives us a picture. The picture is important. Okay, the picture also has information on it that's not given in, the, in those words. So don't ignore the picture. Okay, you'll notice the picture isn't labeled for which function is which. So they have an expectation that you can figure out which function is which one. But they do give us some additional information in that picture. So you'll notice they've got some things labeled over here. They've got some values labeled on their picture. That's helpful, and we're going to use that stuff. But before we do that, we want to think about which function is which. So first of all, I've got a 2x squared. I've got a parabola that with a positive leading coefficient, meaning it's open up. So I have some sort of concave up parabola shape. So that is certainly this bottom one right here, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and make sure I remember this one is called f of x. That's my f of x function. So I'm gonna label that. You might just quick draw a rough sketch in your notebook of those pictures. We're gonna draw this a couple times for different reasons. The other one ends up being this crazy cosine graph, this g of x one. 
And the way I know that, first of all, is because cosine of zero is one. Like if I were to plug in zero, if you guys remember our basic cosine graph, we get cosine of zero is one. Well, four cosine of zero, in this case, the way that this graph is written would be four, right? Because cosine of zero is one, we get that shape. We have that maximum point at the uh, zero for x equals zero, okay? So we know that that's our cosine graph. They don't expect you to necessarily know how to graph that whole thing in the period, but you can, you can use this graph to deduce some of that stuff. Okay, part A, we're gonna start there. Part A says find the area. Do not write A equals. That's a mistake some guys make. Do not write R equals. I know that they said the region is named R. That's not the same as writing area equals. If we are asked to find the area, we are going to write area equals. Some of you have gotten the feedback in your work that I'll write no floating work. That means you need to be labeling what you're finding and that you need to have equal signs all along the way, okay? Area equals is what we're going to set up first. And we're going to have an integral. Now, area is just top minus bottom. So all we have to figure out is what the top graph is and what the bottom graph is, which is visual. We can look at this. So our top graph is going to be 4 cosine of 1 fourth pi x. That would be our top graph minus our bottom graph. Be careful here. You might just distribute the negative or you might put minus parentheses. I'm gonna do minus parentheses and I'm gonna have minus two X squared minus six X plus four. Maybe just so that we're all consistent, you all do minus parentheses here so that we're on the same page. Okay, a couple things that we're still missing. We're missing our bounds. Normally, what we've talked about is to find our bounds, we would set the two equations equal to each other and solve. That gets kind of messy here, trying to figure out where this parabola and that a trig function are equal. And this is a no calculator question. I pulled this from the no calculator section. Okay, so make sure you understand that we actually don't need to find our bounds because they're shown on here, but you have to interpret them correctly. We have a two and a four. Our bounds are not from two to four. Our bounds are X values. So that four is a Y value, but you can clearly see it's on the Y axis. So the X value there would be zero. So I should be going from zero to two. Everything in this is with respect to X. I'm doing a top minus bottom. So I also need a DX. One really sad way to get, to lose a ton of points on FRQ is to forget your DX because we stop grading. We just don't even look at the whole thing. Okay, so make sure you have that. Are there any questions on the setup so far? This problem gets harder and it's a, a good review of our U substitution that we're gonna go through here. Because a lot of you, as I said, really struggled on that U sub test. So I picked one where we would need some U sub. We can do some practice. Okay, any questions on this so far? All right, so the reason we need U sub is for this portion of the equation right here. Oh, I didn't select the right thing, sorry. This portion of the equation is why we need U sub. Like if I were to take a derivative of that, I would need chain rule, so I'm gonna need U sub. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna split this integral. So where that subtraction sign is, I'm gonna actually have two integrals. So I'm gonna have area equals, please copy this down, the integral from zero to two, of four cosine of one fourth pi x dx. And then separately, I'm gonna have minus the integral of two x squared minus six x plus four, also from zero to two of dx. We're allowed to do that. If it's all that's the difference between them is a minus or a plus, you can split up your integrals into two things. Because the u sub really is only necessary for the left side integral. So I'm gonna do, that left side integral with u sub, the u I'm going to pick, please copy this down because so many of you mess up your u sub. You think you have a cheat way, you think you have a quick way and you're not showing the right work and I need to make sure you understand this. Okay, our u is gonna be the stuff inside that parentheses, which is one fourth pi x. Our du is going to be the derivative of one fourth pi x, which is one fourth pi dx. Several of you got marked off because you didn't have a dx there. Make sure you have the du on the left, the dx on the right. I try to get all constants to the left side unless they're exactly written like that in the problem. So I'm going to multiply the four up, divide the pi over. So I get four over pi du is equal to dx. Okay, that's the work I needed for my u sub. When I plug this back into my area equation, I get a four 
times a four over pi. So I'm gonna make that a 16 over pi out in front. So again, that's this four from the original problem times the four over pi from our u sub. So that gets me four times four over pi or 16 over pi, okay? And then I have the integral. I have cosine of u du. So again, four over pi du, that replaced this dx in there. I still had a four left, which is how we got a 16 over pi. Okay, and then what's left in the equation is just cosine of what u was, so cosine of u. The thing that so many of you missed on the last test that we took was changing your bounds. You have to go back and change your bounds. So my current bounds are an x equals zero and an x equals two, because that integral is with respect to x. I need integral with respect to u, so I need bounds with respect to u. So we're gonna use this relationship between u and x, okay? I'm gonna plug my x value into that equation. So for example, I'm gonna plug in my bottom bound, x equals zero, and I get u equals one fourth pi times zero. That's just zero, so that one didn't change, okay? Then I'm also gonna plug in the top bound, I get one fourth pi times two, that's two pi over four or the same as pi over two. Okay, so that's my integral on the left. Now, I really wanna make sure we're good with this u sub. Are there any questions on this so far? Okay, so we're gonna keep going. Now we're gonna actually take the integral. So we get 16 over pi, that just comes along. The integral of cosine is positive sine. And it, since we're doing an integral of cosine of u, it's positive sine of u. You'll notice I do not have an integral shown here. You should not have that like squiggle S thing shown here because you've already taken the integral. What you should have is a vertical line with a zero and a pi over two on it. And now what you're going to do is you're going to plug in both those values. You're going to get 16 over pi times sine of pi over two minus sine of zero. Uh, you'll notice I don't have a plus C here. The reason I don't need a plus C is because there is bounds. So if there are bounds provided, you don't need a plus C. Other things you'll notice. I never went back and plugged this guy in here. When you have U substitution on a bounded integral, you don't go back and plug in your u, or you don't go back and plug in your x, excuse me. And you don't go back and change these back to x's. Everything is in terms of u once you take that integral. Chase, do you have a question? Or did someone have a question? It sounds like someone might be unmuted. I thought it was Chase. Question? Check if you're muted, everybody. Okay, so we get that. Uh, now we need to know our unit circle, sine of pi over two. Pi over two is up here. We're looking at the y coordinate up here for sine uh, and sine of pi over two is just one. So we get 16 over pi times one minus sine of zero. Sine of zero is the y coordinate when the angle is zero, so that's zero. So we just get 16 over pi. This is not even our final answer. This is part of our answer for part A of this entire question, okay? So there's a lot of work. This is no calculator. You have to show all the work. You have to show all the steps. I wanna make sure we understand how to do this. Not all of them take this much work and part B and part C take a lot less work. So, but you should be spending about 15 minutes on each of these problems, okay? And we've spent, mostly cause I'm talking so much but we've spent already about 15 minutes on this, okay? All right, next part is a lot easier because the integral of the yellow side is a lot easier. So now we'll take the integral of the, the yellow side. We get minus the, uh, sorry, I'll just actually take the integral because we don't need to do any use of on the, the right side. We get two X cubed over three. That minus is gonna apply to all of this stuff. So I'm just throwing a minus out in front. So minus two X cubed over three minus, we're gonna have six X squared over two or minus three X squared plus four X, don't get rid of the four. Some people think, oh, four is a constant, it goes away. That's if you're taking a derivative, not an integral. And then I don't need a plus C because I've got bounds, I'm taking it from zero to two. I'm gonna evaluate this by plugging in that two. So we have minus parentheses two times two cubed over three, minus three times two squared plus four times two, minus, now you're really subtracting zero because it's a polynomial. So you don't need to show plugging all of that in, but I would write minus zero just so you know that you've plugged that in. Be careful, sometimes the bottom bound is zero and you don't get a zero as a result. Like if it's a cosine in there, cosine of zero is not zero. Or if you've got some E's in there, 
e raised to the zero is not zero. So just be mindful of that. But this one's a polynomial, so we get zero. We're gonna go ahead and keep simplifying this. We have uh, minus two times two cubed, two cubed is eight times two is 16. So we have 16 thirds minus three times two squared. So three times four is 12 plus eight. Already that's much more simplified, right? This was a way easier one than the left side. And now we can distribute that negative minus 16 thirds plus 12 minus eight or the same as minus 16 thirds plus four. I can change that. So times three over three, we get minus 16 thirds plus 12 thirds is minus four thirds. So our final answer here would be area equals 16 over pi minus four over three. It's not units, it's not unit squared. No units were given. Don't make up some random thing. Don't ever write the word units, that's silly. Um, that's the process for part A. Again, biggest point here is top minus bottom. That's really the new stuff. I took some time to walk through this because I wanna make sure we feel better about U sub. So make sure you're comfortable with that U sub. Okay, any questions here? All right, we're gonna move on to B. I yeah, go ahead. Okay, so for that last problem, um, I know for the sake of the U sub, we were using sine of U instead of replugging in one over four pi X. But if we were to do that in, in like any case, wouldn't we have to continue to use the zero to two bound? We, would, we wouldn't be able to use zero to pi over three, obviously, correct? Correct, which is why it's not a deal because then you have to go back, you have a harder problem, you have more stuff that you're plugging in and you have to change back your bounds. Even if Scheller, even if you wanted to plug back in the one over four or one fourth pi X or whatever, you still have to change your bounds here. Otherwise we stop grading because now your integral is wrong, right? Because that integral says with respect to you. So it's not beneficial to go back and plug back in. Yes, you could, but also it's a required thing to know. It's faster and it's on the MC as well, where you're going to have to change the bounds. Uh, where they're just going to say what's an equivalent integral if you don't know how to change your balance or change your u then you're going to get stuck okay so yeah you you could do that if you changed it back then you'd also have to change back to the x's which is why we don't do that okay excellent all right let's move on question b question b and question c have like this great little phrase that you should be very excited about anytime you see it it says write but do not evaluate Write but do not evaluate means set it up and stop. It means you don't actually have to take the integral. You don't have to go through all of that U sub and solving. It just means set it up. And you're gonna see that occasionally on there. When you see that, underline it or circle it so that you don't kill 10 or 15 minutes of time solving something that you don't need to solve. Okay, so write but do not evaluate is what's on here. For part B, it says write but do not evaluate an integral expression that gives the volume of the solid generated when R so that's that region R is rotated about the horizontal line Y equals four. So I'm taking this region and I'm rotating it about Y equals four. If I were you, I would go ahead and draw another version of this picture so that you have one that's just set up for our volume of revolution problem. And I would label Y equals four with a little dotted line and I would draw that region again, okay? So make sure you have that drawn. Doesn't need to be perfect, just a quick sketch so that you can see how that picture looks. Cause we're gonna go ahead and draw all over this picture as exactly as I would encourage you to do if we were given this as a free response on paper, it like you will be in May, hopefully. Um, then you can draw all over your picture, okay? Before we start drawing or doing anything else, we're gonna set up the bones of our equation. So we are gonna notice that it's telling us that we are rotating this. That word rotated is important. The word volume by itself is not really enough to know how to set this up. We are looking for the words volume and rotated or volume and revolved. So I am now gonna set up volume equals, sorry, a giant cloud just came in. So I know I got a lot darker here. Uh, we're gonna write volume equals. We're going to have the bones of our equation, which are pi and integral of parentheses squared minus parentheses squared. And then notice we are rotating it about a horizontal line. So I'm rotating it this way. That means we're gonna have a DX. Again, great way to lose points. Forget your DX, forget your pi. Okay, you need to have the pi, you need to have the DX. You need to have a parentheses squared minus a parentheses squared. That's the bones of our equation. Okay, now from here, 
we already know our bounds. Our bounds are with respect to x. They're going to be those same x bounds we did before. So our x bounds are going to be from 0 to 2. Any questions on that so far? Because we're about to get into the more complicated stuff. OK, so from here, what we're doing is we're going to put our pen or our pencil. Let me pick a different color. Let's do red. We're going to put that on the thing I'm rotating it about. So I like to put a dot on the thing I'm rotating it about. So rotating it about y equals 4, so that's the first place I'm going to put my little dot. I can do it over here, actually, even further. And I'm going to draw not to the farthest point. doesn't matter what the farthest point is, just what the farthest curve away is. So the farthest curve away is this one. It doesn't matter where I connect it to that curve. Because that length is going to change, right? That length is variable. It changes depending on where I am. I just care about going to the farthest out curve. That length is going to be my R out. Whatever that length is, is my R out, my outer radius, which goes in that first parentheses. But it's a little hard to think about what that length is. So there's another thing we're going to think about. Please make sure you're watching up here right now so you understand it. The distance from the x-axis to that curve, anywhere on that curve, but the distance from the x-axis to anywhere on that curve is that parabola. So that distance is f of x. No matter where we are on that curve, the distance from the x-axis to that curve is f of x. The total distance from the x-axis to my thing I'm rotating it about, in this case, is 4. No matter where I am, the distance from the x-axis to the thing I'm rotating about is 4. So I'm looking for the difference of those two things, meaning my r out would be what? 4 minus f of x. Absolutely. Ooh, let's change that color. That's hard to see on green. So yes, we would have 4 minus f of x. Here's what's awesome about frq. They called it f of x. They called it f of x up here. So we can call it f of x, and we don't even have to write that whole function. We don't have to write 4 minus 2x squared minus 6x plus 4. You could. It's fine if you want to, but you don't have to. You can just call it f of x since they just called it f of x. Okay, so that's we're done with that first part. That's our outer radius. Now let's look at our inner radius. So for our inner radius, we're going to put it on, again, the thing we're rotating it about. And we're going to draw it to the closer curve. So we always start with the farthest, the outer curve, and then the inner curve. OK, so we're going to go to the closer curve. This is going to be our R in that we're looking for. So again, we got to think about this. Well, the total distance from the x-axis to here, that distance is my g of x curve. The distance from the x-axis to this thing I'm rotating about is 4. So my R in is 4, oops, again, wrong color, 4 minus my g of x. Here's what's awesome. You're done. This is it. That's like all you have to do, and that's the whole problem. This answer is worth between 3 and 4 points just for this without having to solve an integral. Just the setup is worth 3 or 4 points. That differential equation problem is worth 6, so it's more, but a ton more steps. Right? All you have to do here is to get here and you have three or four points. If you forget a squared or a dx or a minus or a pi, that's a huge problem and you lose all those points. Okay? Any questions on this problem? Okay, so now we're going to do this cross sectional volume that we haven't talked about at all before. So this is brand new for everyone. I haven't had you watch a video on this or anything. We're on part C. Okay? So part C says the region R is the base of a solid. For this solid, each cross section perpendicular to the x axis is a square. So I want to break this down a little bit. Okay, imagine this thing that's up on your screen right now is lying flat on your desk. Okay, so I have this like weird shape R, it's lying flat on my desk. What it's saying is each cross section perpendicular to the x axis. So that means like a cross section perpendicular to the x axis. I'm slicing that region, okay, perpendicular to the x-axis. So this is the x-axis, perpendicular. And it's going to create a square, meaning there is a square coming out of that paper. I have like a little square coming out of that region, 
okay? It doesn't have any depth to it at all. So it's a little square coming out of that region. Well, that square is gonna change. Like up here, that square is pretty tiny, right? And then down here, that square gets bigger because I have a larger base. And I'm gonna have all of those filled in. So I'm gonna have squares for that whole thing, okay? You don't have to be able to visualize that. You don't have to be able to draw that. I'm just explaining that that's what's happening. What we're trying to do is we're trying to find the volume of that solid. It wants us to write an integral expression that finds the volume of the solid. So the idea is we are going to add up all of the areas of those squares. We're gonna find the area of each of those squares and add them all up but there's infinitely many squares. So the way that we do that, the way we add up all those areas of squares is we take an integral. And if you think about how an integral works, if I were to integrate something like X squared, I get an X cubed. When I integrate an area, I end up getting a volume. That's what we're doing. We're gonna integrate an area to get a volume, okay? But first let's go back through our list of things that I talked about when we said cross-sectional area. So again, that word we're looking for is cross-section. When you see that word in these area volume stuff, cross section, we're gonna follow this path. We need first an expression for our base. So our base means the thing that's, um, let me draw it in black. This length here is our base. Okay, that's the portion that we're gonna to try to come up with an expression for, for our base. Right, and we're gonna kind of take this in a similar approach. Like, well, the length from here to here is that top curve from the x-axis to there, that's that top curve, which we know is called g of x. The length from here to here is f of x. So in this case, our base would be g of x minus f of x. And again, you could call it four cosine and one fourth pi x minus that polynomial. But just to make this a little simpler, we're gonna call it g of x minus f of x, okay? That's the first thing. So we found an expression for our base. Our base is just whatever it told us is lying in that region, perpendicular to that x-axis, that's the base of our square. Now, they tell us that we're trying to create a square. There's a shape that they're gonna give us. So now what we need is we need an area of that shape. So an area of a square is base squared, right? Well, our base specifically is g of x minus f of x. So that area of one of those squares is gonna be g of x minus f of x squared because we're gonna take that base and square it. Okay, now the final thing we need to do here is to write an integral expression. So volume, we're finding the volume of that solid. Volume is gonna equal, I don't have a pi this time, there's no pi as a part of this. It's just the integral of this equation, right? So we're taking the integral of area to get volume. So our integral of area means g of x, minus f of x, quantity squared. We are going to do dx on this, since I was doing essentially a top minus bottom or something with respect to x. And I'm going to have x bounds, which again are gonna go from zero to two. And that's it, that's the whole answer. This problem would be worth two to three points. Okay, so again, the process is come up with an equation for your base, come up with an area equation that uses that base, and then integrate that area equation. Okay, what questions do y'all have on any parts of this problem? Uh, how would you do that if it was with respect to y? We're going to do an example next, Chase. Other questions? Would this technically be the, oh, go ahead, Samson. Um, would this technically be the same, same idea as just doing the volume with the, uh, uh, the volume of revolution or no? Because so it, it, no it is technically the same idea. So the idea of the volume of the revolution, the place where we get like pi r out squared minus pi r in squared comes from pi r squared. 
right? Maybe that's obvious, maybe that's not. The idea when you're rotating something is you create a circle. If I took a slice and I rotated it, I create a circle. So the area of that circle, if I'm just looking at the portion with no missing piece, would be pi like big R squared, for example. But what happens is it's like this piece is being rotated. So I have like a missing chunk in the middle. And so what happens is we have like another radius here, which is like our pi inner radius. And so the area of like this remaining shape is really pi big R squared minus pi little r squared. That's what like the area of that like remaining shape is. So the, the reason we integrate it is because we want to add up all those donuts or whatever disks, right? We're just taking one of those areas and we're going to add them all up because that's what an integral does. So it, yes, it is the exact same idea. The reason I teach it differently is because anytime we're rotating, it is always that equation, pi integral of something squared minus something squared every single time, anytime we're rotating. If we're doing a cross-sectional volume, the, the area equation changes. So that's why there's a slightly different process there. Great question. Samson, what's your question? I was just sort of wondering if you want to be more about volume in general. Like, wouldn't for the last one, didn't, since we already found the area of A, wouldn't we just have to multiply by the height to find the volume of C? Nope. Nope. Because it's not this, it's not constant. Like those rectangles are changing, or those squares have different values along the way, right? I have a very small oh. little one right here, and then I have a big one here. So if I just took that area and multiplied it by one thing, you're coming up with like one shape over here which is not how it looks. Does that make sense? Good, okay, excellent. Let's do the next problem. We're gonna skip over part A. If you guys wanna just go ahead and quick draw this shape, you get Y uh, equals two rad X and then Y equals six. Unfortunately on this one, they don't name it F of X and G of X. So we can't just randomly name it F of X and G of X. They call both of them Y. So we're gonna have to use the Y equals two rad X or the Y equals six, okay? So go ahead and draw that shape. Again, there's information on the graph shown. So the information on the graph is nine, six as that point up there. And then we see kind of that we're at zero, zero on that bottom left or zero, six for that top left. And that's again called region R. So I think we're comfortable with finding the area. So I'm gonna skip over that part. Again, find the area. All you're doing is top minus bottom, take the integral, plug in those values. Second part, part B says, write but do not evaluate an integral expression that gives the volume of the solid generated when R is rotated about, and I'm gonna change this so just so we have a slightly different example. I'm gonna make it Y equals negative two. Okay, so we're gonna rotate this about Y equals negative two. So this is slightly different, but it'll help us understand. Okay, so we're gonna start with part B. Since it's Y equals negative two, that means we are rotating it down here. So I would draw your picture. I would draw y equals negative two here. Again, the process is that we're gonna put our pencil on the thing we're rotating it about. So that's y equals two. And we're gonna draw it to the, oh, I forgot to set up my bones. Toshner, what are you doing? Volume equals, before we do anything else, pi integral, something squared minus something squared. We're rotating it about a horizontal line so we're gonna have a dx. Common question that comes up that I haven't been asked yet, but I wanna clarify. You will never rotate it about a diagonal line. You will only rotate it around a horizontal or a vertical. You will also never rotate it about something that cuts your area as in part of it, okay? So you will always rotate it about something outside of your uh, region. Okay, so we put our pencil on the thing we're rotating it about. I'm gonna draw it to the furthest away curve, which is this total length here. Okay, this works slightly differently than the last one. So the distance again from the x-axis to this curve, if I went all the way from here to here is six, but I am now extending that, I'm adding to that. And the amount I'm adding to that is an additional two to get to that next line, right? So I'm gonna just write that literally as six plus two. Yes, I know it's eight but I would actually encourage you to write it as six plus two. That's what it's gonna say in the rubric. And there's a reason we're gonna show it that way. Okay, so I would write it as six plus two. Okay, now if we draw from our region that we're rotating it about to the closer curve, 
So again, oops, I erased that, didn't mean to. If we rotate it or we draw our pencil from the thing we're rotating it about to our closer curve, we get this length here. Riley, tell that guy to go away. So then we have our length from the x axis to the curve is our two rad x. And then we're going an additional two to get to that area of rotation. So we have an additional two here. So just like on the previous one, we're going to have our function, in this case, two rad x, and then plus two. Okay. Now we just need our bounds. Our bounds are going to go from zero, since we're with respect to x, to our x value, which is nine. Some guys accidentally choose the six. Make sure you choose the nine, because that is our x value. This is all you have to do. You don't have to simplify. You don't need to square things. That's it. Three to four points for this setup. That's it. Okay. But get in that process of drawing your thing you're rotating it about, drawing from the rotation point to the farthest away, rotation point to the closest. And I don't mean farthest away point. I don't mean closest point. I mean curves. Okay. Those are going to be variable. Any questions on this problem? Some of you are getting distracted. We still have another example. Any questions? Okay, we're going to do another cross sectional volume. Chase a second ago asked what happens if it's with, with, with respect to y. We're going to do one with respect to y now. So let's read how this question is slightly different. It says region R is the base of a solid. For each y where zero is less than or equal to y is less than or equal to six, the cross section of the solid, again, that word cross section is important, taken perpendicular to the y-axis. So I'm looking at a cross section that is now perpendicular to the y-axis. So that means we're not cutting the region this way this time. That means we're actually cutting the region this way. That is going to be my base. So my base is now going to be this way. If I was taking it this way, that would be a function with respect to x. Since I'm taking it this way, it's now a function with respect to y. Because that slice is now perpendicular to the y-axis, that means we are now taking it with respect to y. So we're going to have a y integral. Everything's going to have to be in terms of y, including our base. So the first thing we do here is find the equation for our base. So our base is going to have to be with respect to y. Well, we have some information. So we know this curve is y equals two rad x. But that's not with respect to y. That's currently with respect to x. So if I want to get that exact information with respect to x, what I have to do, or with respect to y, excuse me, I have to solve for the x. So we're going to divide by two. I hope everyone's paying attention here. This is where we usually get questions. So I'm going to divide by two, and then I'm going to square both sides. So we get y over two quantity squared equals x, or the same as x equals y squared over four. That is the same exact curve as y equals two rad x, but it's now with respect to y, okay? And if you're looking at it this way, right, the distance from here to here, anywhere on that curve is y squared over four. That's the distance anywhere on that curve. So I don't have to subtract anything from my base this time because that is the distance from the y-axis. And that's what my base is. My base is that horizontal little chunk. So my base equation, y squared over four. Okay, now we have a different shape. They didn't ask us to come up with a square this time. They said that the cross section of the solid taken perpendicular to the y-axis is a rectangle whose height is three times the length of its base. So we have a rectangle whose height is the three times the length of its base. So area of a rectangle is base times height. Make sure you're writing this down, everyone. But in our specific situation, we are dealing with a height that is three times the length of the base, meaning height is really 3B. And I end up getting the equation 3b squared. B stands for base. So 3b squared is my area equation. Because we had a rectangle whose height is three times its base. So in this one, I have like this very tall rect, that's way too tall, but you know what I mean. I have a very tall rectangle coming out. 
whose height is three times its space. That's very exaggerated three times, but you get the idea. Okay, so it's not a square this time. We now need to write that equation with a base in there. So our base was y squared over four. Again, that base needed to be with respect to y because we now had a slice that was in the other direction. Samson, do you have a question? Something okay. the speaker actions went on. Okay, focus, focus. So we have that equation now. All we need to do now is integrate that equation. So we're going to have area, uh, volume equals, because we're asked to find a volume. We don't have a pi here. Pi was a part of that circle that we were rotating. That's the only reason we had a pi. Okay, so our equation is three times y squared over four. Oh, excuse me, squared. Someone didn't call me out on that. We are doing three times the base squared. So we have three times y squared over four squared, because that's three times my base squared. Okay, and then now we should have a dy here. Now we need our bounds on this one. So on the previous problem, our bounds were zero to nine because we were going from x equals zero to x equals nine. Well, our bounds on this one should be from y equals zero to y equals six. And again, this was another one, right? But do not evaluate. All we have to do is set it up, box our final answer, and we're done. Okay, what questions do y'all have? I know this is a lot of stuff and it's hard. What questions do y'all have? Any questions? Even if you think it's dumb, even if I already went over it, what questions do you have? Oh, why do you have at like y equals six, like um, like to to the volume, like to our integral? Why is it just so we had, because we were taking it this way, our function is with respect to y instead of with respect to x, right? Like a normal function, this way is with respect to x. So this way is with respect to y. So I needed to change my bounds because everything in here needs to be with respect to y, I should have a y equals bound and another y equals bound. So we had to use the y coordinate because we're really going from y equals zero to y equals six. That's the chunk we're looking at. Okay, excellent. Other questions? Uh, why does integrating the area give you the volume? So what integrating does is it adds up all of those little pieces. That's what an integral does. Like if you think about a Riemann sum, Maybe this is too long of a conversation, but that's what it does. It adds up all of the areas. Uh, if you think about it in terms of integrating something like x squared, that tends to help students understand it. Because when we integrate something like an x squared, we get an x cubed, right? So when you integrate something that's like area, you get a volume. But the way that it works mathematically is I'm literally taking each of those rectangles from 0 to 6 and I'm adding all of them up. That's what an integral actually does. We talked about this a little bit with Riemann sums. If you integrate essentially just the function itself, right? what you're doing is you're adding up all of those y values in order to get an area. So we're adding up a bunch of areas to get a volume. Good question. Okay, guys, it's 1149 now. A reminder, you have three FRQs due tonight. They're gonna take you a little while. Right? They should take you between 15 and 20 minutes, but that's like an hour of time. I encourage you to FaceTime each other. I encourage you to work on them with each other. Okay, 